Hey, how's everybody doing? This is a little bit loud. Can you turn it down? There we go. Otherwise, I'm going to scream at everybody. Okay, thanks. Oh, hey. Okay, everybody. Welcome to the beginning of the lecture series. Hope you guys enjoy it. Alright, here we go. Guys, what's really exciting about entrepreneurship is that we're told we're an empty cup. You know, tabula rosa, blank slate. We're this bowl that can be filled. We've got all this potential to go out into the world and make businesses full of eagerness and ability to learn. Unfortunately, that's not true. We are not a blank slate. We are brainwashed. We have within us a long history, started by the Industrial Revolution, of learning that we have to unlearn. We have to unlearn. We have a long history, oh no, of really crappy school that was influenced by the Industrial Revolution. It was. The entire university system was made to fill up factories with workers and machinists and engineers. That was the point, and it hasn't changed. We have a long history of people coming out of school and going to work for large consulting companies and HR companies and other crap companies saying, hey, you're right, this is best practice. These things we learn, this influence from the Industrial Revolution is best practice. And so it's further cemented in our brains and we see it in the media and the news and in articles. And it becomes gospel. It is real. It is the way things are. We hear things like economies of scale. These are fantastic. It's all about economies of scale. We hear things about specialized organizational structures like centralized HR, centralized procurement, centralized back office, centralized finance, facilities management. That becomes gospel. That is right. We get things like carrot and stick incentives in HR. That becomes gospel. Things like best practices, one of my most favorite words. It assumes there is a best practice. Like Plato's platonic ideals of circles and squares. But somewhere out there, there's a best practice for incentives and for centralized HR. I really started hating the word best practice when I was at a conference. And this is a real story I want to tell you here. It just happened last year, last April. I'm at a conference. And this world-class consulting company is up there blabbing away, blabbing away about best practices. That's a good consultant there. And it was about outsourcing and sourcing in general for the back office. And they were like, I kid you not, it was during the Arab Spring, right? So they were like, oh, here we are in Warsaw at this nice consulting conference. And God forbid it happens, just in case, we are now recommending to all of our clients worldwide, all 4,000 clients worldwide, that they have a secondary backup facility in the same region, and one for every region in the world. So if you've got multiple facilities around the world, you should have multiple backup facilities around the world. You know why? Because if there's ever a revolution, and God forbid in Warsaw, we'll just move the people to Prague. Actually, they didn't even say people. They said, we'll just move the resources to Prague. And I thought, oh, so people are now shipping. We're now containers, little resources you can move from Warsaw to Prague. Oh my god, they're having a revolution. Do you honestly think, Mr. Consultant, that if they're having a fucking revolution, they're just going to be like, oh yeah, you know what? Let's just go over to Prague. You know, screw this revolution. It's not that important. What's really important is your back office and your profit. Absolutely. And the only thing I could think at the end of the day, after getting all the brainwashed crap about best practices from this famous consulting company, was this. How did we get to this point? When people are no longer people, we are resources that can be moved around, we are shipping, we're little levers for corporate profit. That's what people are anymore in the corporate world. And that's the sad truth. We have become monsters. We really have. So unfortunately, I'm here to tell you that our glass is not empty. It is full of crap that we need to unlearn. And it's going to be really hard for you to accept this because you've learned it for 20 years, plus or minus. And it has become gospel to you. And it is wrong. 
and you it may not sink in after this one 30 minute lecture, but I just want you to be thinking about it. That you are sheep. <laughs> Might be a few of you that aren't sheep, black sheep out there, but in general we're sheep. And we're sheep to what I call, and I'm starting to call, inertia thinking. It means that we're stuck in the mud. It's this thinking that we just keep thinking because we've always thought that way for 100 years, for 200 years. We're stuck. We're cemented in this old way of thinking, and it's gospel. And it's difficult to challenge. And it's difficult to ask, why are we still thinking this way? Because it's true. So why should we question it? But we should question it because, as is often said, the challenges of the day are far different than the challenges of the Industrial Revolution. We're not trying to fill factories. What we're trying to do is solve a water shortage. That 0.05% of the water on this planet is drinkable, and there's been over 70 wars already just over water, and it's getting worse because we now have 7.2 billion people on the planet. And when I was a kid, there were 3.2 billion. There's exponential growth of people, and there's linear growth, or none, of resources. Those are problems of today. Problems of today and tomorrow are going to be energy problems. And if these are too big, saving the world is not on our agenda, and it's probably not, let's look a little closer to home. So the problems closer to home are still not the problems of the Industrial Revolution. They're, oh my god, how do I compete without borders? How do I make my business in Sofia, or Lagoifrak, or Plevin, or anywhere else better? When Amazon DE ships in two days, cheaper, better, free returns, or anyone else. We are now living in a borderless world when it comes to commerce, when it comes to innovation and invention. And if we don't, do better, that's a serious problem because other people will kick our butts. So again, I want to ask, why are we thinking in the old way when the problems are different? Why are we stuck to this antiquated system of thinking, of working, of striving, of applying to our business best practices, which were best practices for 100 years ago? Especially when we are not machines. Why are we trying so hard to become machines? And I really think we are. Why are we trying to emulate IBM as individuals? We see them as the most profit. We go, oh, we want to become like IBM. We have case studies, which are all about companies. While well, we worship the brands of Apple and Armani. We're trying to become machines when we are people. We do not have the same drive as machines, as artificial intelligence. We're trying to somehow lose our soul to become Profit. We become brands, we become consumers, good little consumers. What are our really goals to think about? And I started thinking about it. What are any goal in life to have? You know, to be fit and healthy. Why? So you can feel good, so you can run a marathon, whatever. To uh, today to meet somebody special. Why? To get married, to have kids. Why? If we just keep asking why, it all comes down to happiness. We want to be happy, we want to love, we want to have a sense of purpose in our life and a sense of freedom. Why do you want to be rich? Why do you want a good career so you can buy a car? Why? So you can buy a house? Why? Be rich? Why? So you can retire? Why? So you can spend more time with family and have freedom and love and a sense of purpose, meaning in your life. So humans are all about these things. Happiness, love, purpose, freedom. Pretty much anything comes down to that. But you really ask why at times. And I encourage you to always do that. Like a child saying, why is the sky blue? And you go, I don't know why. You know, because the way light reflects. But why does it reflect just blue light? I don't know. Here's an ice cream, right? I don't know. What is the point of business? If the real goal of humanity is sense of purpose, love, compassion, meaning, happiness, what is the point of business? We've all been taught this. Come on. Everybody knows. What's the goal of the business? Profit. Thank you. Profit. Anything you look at it across a business, oh gee, why do we want a revenue target? Oh, but then we're going to have to have a higher revenue target when we meet that. But why to make profit? Oh, here's your sales target. Got to have a higher sales target. Sales many, many previous one. More profit. Oh, got to have a promotion for a bigger promotion. Why to make more profit? Oh, we got some cost cutting and some savings. Great, but now let's do it again. Why? Because we want more profit. Profit, 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 profit. That is the point of business. That's the goal of the business. They are machines. They are about making money at all costs. They have no soul. They have no compassion. They don't understand the golden rule. They are assholes. 
Not only that, they're just pieces of paper that live in perpetuity. They live hundreds of years. They never die. They're protected by laws, just like us. We treat them and we elevate them, machines, to the point that they become our aspiration. It's really disgusting. And then these guys just keep perpetuating the myth. The teachers, the consultants, the big businesses, the big brands that want to make you buy more. Because you can't be happy if you just buy a car, then you gotta have a better car. Then you gotta buy a house. Then you gotta buy your summer house. You need a ski chalet, don't you? Of course you do. Why? Why do we need all this stuff when it actually doesn't work as good as we think it does? It is not best practice. And let me give you a real example. And I use this example because we have a lot of these in Bulgaria. A lot of them. Call centers, one of my favorite examples. We have the call center. We've got heaps of them. We've got social call, we've got HP call centers, we've got IBM call centers. We've got heaps of them here. Now, what does the call center do? What are the best practices that we've seen, we read about in call centers? And I've been to lots of little conferences, and the guy gets up there and goes, yeah, we've been able to decrease our cost time, uh, call times from an average of eight minutes down to four minutes. Yes, if we can get rid of that customer quicker because we can deal with more customers and get our service level agreements. <laughs> what else are we gonna do? We're gonna script the conversations. We're gonna make sure we have exactly what you should say. You should be like, they're gonna go, thank you for calling. Blah, 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 blah. Have you reset the power button? Blah, blah, blah. And why do we have scripted conversations? Because we don't trust you. We think you're stupid. You might say the wrong thing. Oops. Control and monitoring. We have somebody in the back with a little headset going, this call can be monitored at all times for your benefit. What are they really doing? Making sure the poor little employee follows the script and has short call times. Get somebody off the phone. Can't say something bad. Can we? 